good to be in God's house today, amen? You know, I wanted to start off just a little bit different this morning. Um, I thought it might be good to kind of get us focused on why we're here today. And I wanted to read from uh, Psalm 100, and it says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We are to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. We're to come into his courts with praise. We are to give him thanks, give thanks to him, and bless his name. And here's why. Verse 5. For the Lord is good. Say that with me, church. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Sing this hymn with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures
things to lift our voices and our hearts to God about today. And I'm going to begin with uh, a voice from the Ukraine. Uh, Chris McKenzie and Pavlov, not even going to try, last name, uh, are over there. And I was just talking to Stacy, and it's just, it's not two or three or four or five or seven or ten. It's swarms of people 
that they are in the midst of placing. But I know this is difficult to see, but it's really the sound you want to hear, uh, a message from Chris. Hello, everyone. I want to share two stories with you guys tonight. Of course, two stories isn't all that I have. I could go on and on with a million different gut-wrenching things that have been taking place here recently. And what's more is the fact that American news isn't covering any of it, at least from what I've heard from my American friends. The first story I want to share with all of you. A boy recently made it to our refugee resource center. He came in absolutely beside himself. He was hysterically crying. His mother and his sister were shocked to see him. Once we approached him and started signing, he was so happy to see people who knew his language. We asked where he was from, and he told us that he was from Kharkiv. Kharkiv. You guys, he made it out safely. He really did it. He took the trek, made it to the border, and I want to thank the Lord that for the last two days our volunteers have been putting in such hard work and, getting, and are getting quicker and quicker at getting people away from the border. This young boy is describing all of the destruction he's seen, eight-story buildings being leveled, the armies having firefights amongst each other, tanks exploding, all the fighting, all of the death. He's seen so much terror, and this boy is only 10 years old. So, of course, he was crying hysterically when he got there, and it only got worse. And his mother told us that he's nervous because of all the cops that were patrolling the area. Now, of course, these cops were there just to protect everybody and make sure everything goes smoothly. But it was so heartbreaking to see. So I made sure to tell him. I was like, you see all these cops? They don't want to hurt you. They're here to protect you. So he started to trust from that point on. And then within a few minutes, he was doing a lot better. And then I told him, I was like, Jesus loves you as well. And then another man... 65-year-old man is telling his experience. He lived in, a, in an apartment complex, half of which got completely destroyed. He saw many new apartment complexes, about 20 stories high, get completely leveled, reduced to cinders. I was shocked to hear it. All this destruction that, he, that he's seen in such short time, that could mean about two to three hundred thousand people dying in one week's time. It's a shocking thing. It's hard to believe. And again, American news isn't covering any of it. At least I highly doubt it. Whole cities are being totally destroyed. People are dying. Death is everywhere. And the Russian army is also everywhere, like ants, all over the place. The man was describing that the... That the Soldiers are all over the place. And he's also told us that at least 40 to 50,000 Russian soldiers have died. The Ukrainian army is standing strong. They've lost very little. I just want to ask you guys again, keep praying. Keep the Ukrainian people in your prayers. You have no idea all the gut-wrenching things I've heard. I am so shocked to hear everyone's experiences, and it just breaks my heart. And when people make it, I make sure to give them the gospel. I tell them that it was God's plan for them and that Jesus loves them and he wants a relationship with them. And all the people I've told that to can't help but concede. They agree that, yes, that's exactly what ha is happening. They can't help but see God's sovereignty in all of it. So just remember to pray for the Ukrainian people. Thank you. Mm. There are no words. Uh, children, babies, mothers, soldiers, war. And I, I want you to remember that, that you have made possible uh, for m so many, so many of these people who are deaf or mute, that are, are just struggling, that don't know what to do, that are finding this release. And they are now trying to get those places of refuge for them. And for many, it's just to go into a uh, some type of shelter or a compound or something like that. But uh, this isn't over. It's probably just begun. And I just want you to pray that God would intervene. That is all that's going to stop this. An act of God that can stop this and save the lives of people. Speaking of ministry to people, I want our student missionaries to come down, students and young, young adults that are going. This is going to be a special group 
that's going to Albuquerque. And uh, I'll let uh, Andy, when he grabs the mic there on the way down, give you a little overview. Uh, the choir today is Addison and his harem. Uh, thank you, Addison, for bringing all your girlfriends. <laughs> we got to work on some young guys in the choir, Andy. It's getting a little lonely for him up there. Y'all you know, double line probably. No, maybe we can stretch across. Keep moving a little more there, Ben. All right. Andy, tell us what's going on here. Uh, we'll be heading to Albuquerque on Saturday. We'll be partnering with FBC Amarillo and their college ministry. And we're going to be serving four churches in the Albuquerque area. All right. What are you going to be doing with them? Um, we'll be working with a church planning network called Anchor Network. Um, we'll be helping them with their one facility that they have for a couple oh. of churches. Um, Mark, Julian, I can't, I don't know where he's at right now. Mark was with me. Um, we'll be helping with some houses um, and some people in the community that they've been ministering to for years. Uh, pretty incredible stuff. Uh, helping paint in another facility. Uh, one church plant gets free use of a building. Um, and, and we'll be helping them because that building doesn't really have a maintenance crew. And so the members, while I was at the church, a member came up because they noticed the heater wasn't working. And so they fixed it, even though it's a private business's heater. And the heart of that church's members and their staff is to do everything they can to fix the building. And so we'll come, give them a week of relief in that. What's the economic level of the surrounding area that you're working? Uh, one of the churches is primarily surrounded by people who work at Intel. So that's a pretty affluent area. Mm -hmm. um, the bulk of our work will be in the poorest area of Albuquerque where yeah. you can buy a house for about $30,000. There, there's some rough areas up there in that uh, town. And I know that they're struggling to try to make things meet. Now, Jim's going with you, isn't he? Yes. Jim, why why, why is he know. sitting out there and not up here know. with you? I don't know. I'm confused. Okay. Uh, I just love to call out our staff members. It's just so much fun. Well, I want you all to know that I am so grateful that you would say, I would gladly give my time on my break that I could do a lot of things and spend it sharing the gospel of Christ and helping out wherever you can go. As you go, it's very important that you remember that you are, you feel called to this, that you're not going along because it's fun. It'll be a great time. There's nothing any more binding than fellowship and service, but that you're going because you want to see your life make a difference. I pray that you will experience the joy of giving your life away because there's nothing that brings more satisfaction and nothing that brings more joy than when you give yourself away to someone and you see the difference that it makes. I pray for safety for you. We also pray that you would recognize that you have a responsibility to each other. You know, the Bible says, go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then instruct them in the practice of all I've commanded you. I'll be with you to do this after day after day right up to the end of the age you are representing Northside Baptist Church and I pray that you will understand that your actions and your behavior should be that that the church would be proud of in all of your conversations and all of your actions that people would see that there's a difference in your life I would ask you these three questions and request your response do you feel that God has called you to go on this trip do you accept the Bible as the word of God? This is the only authority you have. This is the only message you bring. All the other messages are secondary. It is what we want to communicate to the world. And is it your desire to serve with the compassion of Christ in your heart and minister to these people? My last question is, will you endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and to promote the fellowship of this group and our church and conduct yourselves honorably on this trip. We have another group that's already gone. Uh, some of our members are in, um, some of our members are in Honduras. Uh, the uh, Kelly, Wendy Kelly and uh, her son Carter 
and the Cochrane, Kristen Cochrane and Ella Cochrane are in Honduras, and then Canyon Kelly and Ty Miller are in Egypt. Emma Hudson's also in Honduras with I them. thought I saw her picture She'll on that. She'll be landing bus. on Friday from Honduras and rolling out on Saturday with us to Albuquerque. I'm gonna go with you, huh? Might as well. <laughs> That's great. All right, circle, 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 circle. Come on in here. This is a circle, yes. A circle has no end, no beginning. I first want to express my deep love and appreciation to you for what not only you're doing on this trip, but what you've done with the student ministry of this church and the adult young adult ministry. It is awesome to see what God's doing through you. And my heart is so blessed. God, I pray that as these go to do a work that is special, you will guide them into the needs that are present. You would provide for them the words to say, the hands to lay on what the need is. I pray God above all that they would be blessed in their own spirit to know that you have given them a purpose in life that's above all others. I pray for their safety and I pray for their fellowship. Begin to work in the people of Albuquerque begin to work in their hearts so that when these come, they will be received with joy. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Church, forgot to ask one question. Will you pray for them as we commission them on this trip? Amen, great. I wanna share some last needs with you today. These are all so very important. Uh, one, I want to thank uh, Francis Maddox and Michelle Scoggins for the radio broadcast in memory of their husband, Jim. Also pray for the family. Ryan Elliott's father passed away this week, as did David Ruckers. There's three prayer quotes out there, and all of these are dear to my heart. Eddie McCollum, Eddie and, and Diane, or our members here, they've been involved for some years, but Eddie is has had serious problems since a serious accident that affected his brain. He's been in the hospital for 80 days due to a complication from surgery. And miraculously, he's made that. And we want this quilt for rehab. We want to pray for Laura. Laura Patton will be having surgery for breast cancer. And she asked prayers for her recovery. For God's peace, where'd you go? I just saw her. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I love you. And we know God's got this, don't we? All the way through. We're gonna pray for her and tie that knot. Then the little boy I talked to you about last week, Axel, there's a prayer quilt out there for him. Uh, this still two-year-old that has such incredible uh, battle against cancer and fighting not only the cancer, but to keep his blood pressure up and to get his appetite going where he'll be able to receive. I live in a world of needs. I think you do too. And I think you probably think of students you have at school, if you're a teacher, coworkers you have at work, neighbors and family. I know Don's brother's fighting cancer. We've been lifting him up for some time. I know many of you, Ukraine is there. This is our gift to all of those people. I pray that you will hear my words and lift your own spirit as we pray together right now. Holy and awesome God, God of power and God of peace and love, I pray that you would bless us on this day. For our family and our friends that are far away, some that are fighting battles, against enemies that are physical, some that are fighting battles against the needs of their own heart, their own bodies. And God, I pray that you would help us to re realize that Jesus is a warrior. Jesus is a fighter. He is the one who has combated sin and will continue to combat it through his spirit within us. As one spirit and one heart, we lift up our prayer for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia, that those individuals might know peace 
and they might know an end to the conflict, that the killing and the slaughtering of babies and families might be stopped today. God, I know in your will and in your wisdom, there's a course for every life. And I know you're in charge of the nations. I also know that you have given man free will and he has the ability to destroy another. I pray God that you would intervene. I pray you'll bless this service. We might hear from you and know better how we can serve one another and you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me say one more thing before I cough. Can you give me a break there? Sunday is daylight savings. But today we're here and we are engaged with God. And I'll tell you what, this next song we're singing, we've never done it in this room. Um, I have had so many people text me and email me and stop me in the halls and say, oh man, we gotta do this song. And I've been praying about it and praying about it. And when you find a song that's like 11 minutes long, you're like, wow, Pastor Van is not gonna like that. So it's been working, and we got it worked down. And so we, we want to sing this with you today. And I'm gonna ask you guys to stand. And let's just sing the chorus together. I think once we you hear it, you'll go, oh yeah, I know the song. It goes like this. Jira, you are enough. That's right. Jira, you are enough. I will be content in every circumstance. Jaira, you are
today on a very special time. And the fact is I've only got 50 minutes to preach a 30 minute sermon. And so we're gonna try to do this as quickly as we can. So if you would raise your hearing aids to a new level, increase your brain. Okay. Well, we're gonna go as far as we can. I can't talk fast if I need to. I, I want you to know that the series we're going into over the next four weeks is a vital series for the, not only the life of our church, but the life of our nation, the life of our community, and the life of your family. I was sitting with a, a man in Wednesday night. I believe his name was Cross. He was brought here by an individual that had won him and his son to the Lord, uh, evangelist we have in our church. And, and I, he was talking to him, and I was talking to the boys. And I said, boys, you know, you're great kids, and I pray you'll be strong. And, you go, and he said, tell him what I tell you every day. And those boys spoke up and they said, follow the rules, be good to everyone and be a leader and not a follower. And I said, stop, be a leader and not a follower. What a difference it would make in the life of our young people if they could do that. And not fall victim to those who sweep them into things that they don't wanna do. They don't wanna be the kind of people that they're made young ladies and young men that get into relationships because they're drawn in and they find out I really shouldn't be here but, but that person's stronger than me and they, they know somehow they end up being a follower and they fall into a trap. There's a great shortage of leaders today as if you hadn't realized it. I'm not talking about people in high positions but individuals, leaders, who know how to understand responsibility and accept that and then engage others in accomplishing tasks and doing things that not only make their nation stronger, their business stronger, but their own lives stronger. It's not just the nation that needs leaders, but it's communities and homes. For too many who are in positions of leadership, they're too focused on their personal agendas to really understand the needs of those that they're in charge of. Their personal agendas ride above everything. True leaders are those individuals who learn how to influence people, not push them or drive them or do things that require them to change without engaging them first. Leadership is not control. Leadership is influence. We're gonna talk about Moses today. A bit of history on Moses. He was the one that God chose to redeem his people. The book of Genesis ends with a long list of about 75 names. And all of these are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, if you're new to the Bible, new to the church, understand that God's people were Israel. And the beginning of that engagement was with Abraham. And when he engaged Abraham, he then took them through a process where they were, they were able to exist. They were able to survive only under the hand of God. They came to Egypt. And the way they got into Egypt was in the middle of a famine where most of them would die had they stayed out there and not had the food that was stored in the grain sheds uh, of, of Egypt. That food was only there because of one man, and his name was Joseph. And Joseph was a Hebrew like them. He wasn't an Egyptian. But God had placed a way for him in a very miraculous way to be in the Egyptian lead. He provided to make sure they had the food, and then he rescued his family. In a very favored place, Jacob's son Joseph was used of God to save the people of Israel. If you don't know and understand about Israel, Israel has been God's favored nation through the beginning. They were his people that he provided a way out of Egypt, we're going to find out, through the leadership of one man, and that man was named Joseph. When they were there in the Exodus, they, there's ominous words about uh, a king or dynasty that came to power and enslaved them. The Pharaoh enslaved them. They had slave masters ruthlessly leading them, made their lives miserable. A little baby in a bucket was saved and his name was Moses. When all the boys were killed to stop the Hebrews from having a leader, a little boy named Moses was floated down a stream and he ended up in the very Egyptian royal family because he was rescued by one of the daughters of the Pharaoh. Oh, what a coincidence. 
That young boy grew up in that home and he learned a lot. He kept a low profile kind of away from his Jewish friends. But his mother ended up being his caretaker. What a coincidence. And she told him all about who he was. And he knew about the story of, each, uh, of, of Israel. And he knew about God's plan. Hebrews 11 reads of this on Moses. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God, rather to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing he who is the unseen. I can imagine Moses sitting at the feet of his mother, who was a Hebrew, and her telling him all about what the Hebrew people had endured. And the fact that he was just of this race, that because of that, all of the people who were like him were being enslaved and wondering, what is God gonna do to save his people. Listen, the greatest privilege of man is to be used by God to perform his work. There is no higher calling. When you do something during the day that is God's work through you, you'll remember that at night. When you do something during the day that you sense that God spoke through you to the life of someone, you'll remember that forever. In my conception of leadership, a leader is someone who is going somewhere with such confident determination that others just naturally fall in behind them. A leader is not a dictator. A leader is a leader. There's no other word that can really describe what it is when you're a leader. It's just that you believe something so much, it's a bigger work than you can perform alone and you invite others to participate and they work off of your energy. Leadership is far more complex than, than most people realize. People are not leaders because they're in key positions. Positions are positions. Positions don't mean leadership. You can become a leader because you can do widgets better than anybody else does widgets. That does not mean you know how to lead people. Many individuals have been moved up a chain of command without the understanding and training and the recognizing of the gifts that it takes to be a leader. And they've been put into a position and they failed miserably. In fact, most of the fatal obstruction that comes to good ideas are from non-leaders that are in positions of leadership. And we have suffered from that greatly in this nation. My last comment on that. It is doubtful that people are born leaders. They talk about, well, they're just a born leader. No, they're just rude. They just, they would keep talking with nobody else. And maybe, you know, I can't talk about people who talk because I tend to do that quite a bit. I was out playing golf and somebody said, I'm sorry, I, inter I, I, I interrupted you. And Rick Hobb said to the guy, if that's the only way you're gonna talk is to interrupt Van, because it'll never stop. <laughs> Leadership is, is often seen between people who have some natural gifts. Maybe they talk well with people. Maybe they, they are intelligent. Maybe they have some personal charisma. But I've seen people with all kinds of charismas that were great leaders. I've known people that really couldn't really communicate well themselves, but their confidence their character and their vision drove people. Someone who has the ability to do something well is not automatically a leader. Talent does not mean leadership. The fact that you can do something better than somebody else may mean that you just get people around you to brag about it. And yet we're often surprised when someone who we would, we would least think would be the one 
with the vision and the character and the determination that rises up and becomes a leader. I believe that God is, is raising up leaders in this church. I believe that there are people who are seeing things that need to be done and they're not waiting to see if anybody else would see them and call a meeting. I believe that there's individuals who rise up within a group and say, you know, if somebody doesn't make a plan, we're not gonna be able to stay together. Maybe they're the organizer at first and maybe they, they discover one that will lead. When, when Moses was in Egypt, he got all the training that he needed on how to, to do things. He was schooled in leadership practices. He was a prince of the king. He went through all of that training. Uh, he'd studied law. He would learn to, how to express himself. He would learn to become adept in problem solving and project management because that's all that was going on in Egypt. So he's overseeing projects and he's doing what he should there. And all that got him ready for a very special task. There was a day that came when Moses made a fatal error. He was the prince, one of many, and he saw a Hebrew slave being beaten by an Egyptian. One of his people, although he was in the Egyptian family, being bitten, Exodus 2. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren, so he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no one around, he struck down, killed the Egyptian, and hid him in the sand. Now maybe this was just a reactive response. Maybe it was just something that he saw that wasn't fair in, in a human setting, but something in, inside of him that caused him to realize who he really was rose up and took action. And that's what happens when God gets control of your life. Maybe you're in a situation or around something and all of a sudden you just go, I can't let that happen. He later interviewed, intervened between two Hebrew slaves, two of his own people that were fighting, and they looked at him and they said, what right do you have to tell us what to do? You're just an Egyptian and we're gonna tell you something. You do this again and we're gonna tell the king what you did to that other Egyptian. And he went, oh no. The secret's out. I can't stay here anymore. He received that rejection from his people and he knew that he had to flee Egypt. Moses experienced the ultimate fear, reaction by the people that you're trying, rejection by the people you're trying to lead. He, he found that ultimate fear happening and that was his own people turned against him. He was a child of two cultures, but he was a man that God was gonna make into something special. Now I have five more pages, but we're not gonna have time to do it because we come to a very special time and that's the Lord's Supper. I'm gonna invite our Vice Chairman of Deacons and also Terry Lee, I think, to come forward. They're gonna give us our prayers on this. Folks, I want you to know that this is probably the same thing as your baptism. When you do this, it's just like your baptism. There's no difference. You are exhibiting your faith in Christ and you are identifying with his death for your sins. And as you do that, you must come to a place within your own heart where you understand everyone that sees you partaking of this will trust that you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Jesus was with his disciples and suddenly he said to them, gentlemen, I want you to do something. I want you to take this bread if you'll just peel back that top of the bread. He told them that this bread represented his body. 
it was only a piece of it because his body was going to be broken. His body was going to be broken to pay for sin. I think about that. And I think about the fact that what I've done in my life should have wrecked my life. I should be destroyed under the standards of the law. I should be punished for all that took place. But I, my sins were paid for by the body of Jesus on the cross. Gentlemen, come on this way. Terry, Lee, I want you to lead us in prayer and I want you to pray that we will understand what this body means in your life. Jesus, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh unto me will never hunger. Dearly Father, I just thank you so much for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. He took the bread and he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Bible said that he also took the cup. Now, it doesn't give us a lot of instruction on this. And you know, Doug, it's not like he had a speech to make after the bread. It seemed to be that he put them together. He said, I know you don't understand, but my body's gonna be broken for you. But the hardest part, my blood is gonna flow. I'm going to die. And that body, that blood, as you peel back and look at that, represents the very blood of Jesus Christ. Now, my dear friend, you may be cool for you to say, well, I don't do anything more wrong than anybody else. It may be cool for you to say, look what I can do. I can, I can, I can smoke your stove. I can run around. I can do all this stuff that's, that God doesn't, I know God's not pleased with. I can, I can do all of this stuff. I can do whatever I want to do. I'm going to tell you something. Everything we do against the will of God is a sin against God. And it deserves the punishment of wrath of God because it is ugly in his sight and it does not revere his person. And every time we do something, it's not somebody around you that you're really hurting. It's the Father himself. Jesus Christ gave his blood because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. The price for your sin, those ugly words, those ugly actions, that theft, whatever it might be, it would be death. And yet there's one who paid for it. Doug, lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful for this time together. In your book of Ephesians, Lord, it says that through your blood we have redemption for the forgiveness of our sins. What an amazing act of grace the cross was. May each and every day we lay our sin at the cross, knowing that the blood of Jesus is, washes us clean. May everything we do bring glory and honor to his name. In Jesus' name, amen. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it. Do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> as often as you eat that bread and drink that cup, you're sharing that we are awaiting the return of Jesus Christ, amen? Yeah. Folks, <laughs> wars, rumors of wars, all that's taking place, and all of our prophets today that are looking at that are going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, the shaping of the book of Revelation, the book of the second coming, the things from Daniel, all of those things, they're ramping up, they're ramping up. People who are Christians have believed forever that Jesus could come today. You say, well, how can you just keep believing that? Because the signs get higher. People say to me, can you tell me about 
all the things that are happening and the signs that are coming. And I say to them, if we knew every one of the signs, if we knew every one of the things that Jesus said, he said, you're not gonna know it until it happens. So I know this, if I learn it all, I'm gonna be ascending to be with him. I'm gonna say, Jesus, what did we miss? He says, that. And I'll go, how in the world did we miss that? And he said, that was only to be seen on this day. But Jesus is coming again. And taking that cup, you're saying, I believe that he's gonna come to redeem us all. I don't know how I did this. I've got five minutes left. Is that clock right? How did I do this? I could have at least gone to point one. I didn't even make it to point one. Will you come back and hear this story? I guess nobody's coming. Will you, will you come back and hear this story? Will you bring your children so that they can learn how to be a leader. It's one of the most important lessons they'll ever learn. All right. Brother Keith, you have three announcements. You, uh, you're turning over a new leaf, Pastor, letting us out early again. I, I think I've, I think I've been influenced you in a good way. Just a couple things before we go. Uh, there's an announcement in your bulletin, our last pep, uh, parents encouraging parents meeting. The last one of those is tonight. It's on technology. So if you are a parent of uh, particularly uh, fourth through eighth grade, probably, uh, it's a great, great message. And the guys have done a great job with that. It meets in the MSM uh, building upstairs at five o'clock this evening. The women's ministry team are handing out duos invitations. These are uh, kind of a one-on-one -on -one discipleship relationship within our women's ministry. And so they can answer questions for you for those. Uh, those are going out now. And our um, young marrieds class, we're starting a brand new class for young marrieds on March 20th. So right after spring break, uh, Mark and Teresa Julian are gonna lead that for us and we're pretty excited about them getting started in that. It's a great opportunity for us and a great opportunity for them in ministry as well. All right, I had 26 people in my new member class last week. It was a big one. And uh, we got some that are joining today. Suzanne Thomas, Suzanne, where are you? Are you upstairs, downstairs? Well, there you are, she's on the corner there. Suzanne Thomas, she's one of the Midland refugees. There's a handful of those around here too. And uh, so she's coming to us from Midland. If you're excited about Suzanne being part of our church, say amen. Awesome. Michael and Laura Pescada right here in front of me. There's some Springtown folks. And their boys, there were two sets of twins up here earlier in the group of, that's going to Albuquerque. Uh, there's a set of female twins and a set of male twins. And the boys are there. So they've already joined. They joined a few months ago. But they're going on this mission trip next week as well. So if you're excited about Michael and Laura being part of our church, say amen. And then Lloyd and Dolores Peary. Are y'all in here, Lloyd? Lloyd is Renee Oakin's dad. He is super cool. If you know Renee, then you know Lloyd. All right, we're gonna let them join even if they're watching on TV. How about that? Lloyd and Dolores Perry, they're coming from Grand Prairie, but they're also, um, well, they've been all over, so I'm not even gonna try and pick another place other than Grand Prairie. All right, so if you're excited about the Perry's being part of our church, say amen. Awesome, awesome. It's good to see you. Let's pray for the offering, and then... Um, are we going to sing? Yes, because after we took the Lord, they took the Lord's Supper, they left they, singing. <laughs> so well, that's what we're going to do. We've prayed a lot today. I'm just going to get off the stage and let him sing. Okay. You don't want to sing with us? <laughs> okay. Let's stand up as we sing. Because he lives. Here we go. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future, and life is worth a living just because he lives. God bless. We'll see you next week.